My pronouns are he, him. I've been at Slack for two years and guided many of our internal teams on how to instrument and improve observability with traces to solve problems. One particular problem is test flakiness. It's one of those insidious problems that has multiple causes. For engineers, it's extremely frustrating and surface owners, hard to concretely pinpoint. We were able to use tracing to understand flakiness and bring flakiness percentage per PR down about 10x over the last few years. I'm delighted to share a few stories of finding causation for performance and resiliency problems in our infrastructure with Honeycomb. We'll hear about what worked, what didn't, and what helped drive organic adoption for tracing and various use cases. Today, we'll start with a high-level overview of our department, our trace infrastructure using Slack trace and span events, overview of CI infrastructure workflows, initial instrumentation and investments in CI traces, and finally, specific ways teams at Slack use traces to decrease flakes for their customers. I'd love to spend the first few minutes talking about developer productivity and business goals. Developer productivity is about building tools and programs used to get Slack software to customers quickly and with high quality. It's been a fun journey to be on as Slack scales. I work with teams that have the opportunity to make engineering at Slack simpler, more pleasant, and more productive. Both Slack customer and code bases grew very quickly over the past six years. This begs a question, how might we create better internal tools for engineers to build, test, release, and observe deployed code? Well, there are challenges. As the great philosopher Uncle Ben from Spider-Man once said, with great power comes great responsibility. In the same way that it is exciting, there's a shadow side to great growth in customer and code bases, complexity, fuzzy service and team boundaries, and more. Here's a simplified diagram of Slack for desktop and mobile clients. Slack has evolved from a single web app and a hackling mono repo to a topology of many languages, services, and clients that serve different needs. The core business logic lives in web app and routes to other services like a distributed cache called Flannel, search and discovery, and many others. Internal tools were built quickly and scaled just enough for Slack's main monorepo, web app. In 2019, when I joined, our team was already growing and at about six fold. Today, internal teams tool, the internal tools team consists of 50 people, and of course, we're hiring. This, help, this hopefully resonates with y'all as well. Services are reasoned about individually and within team size using logs and metrics. For example, the Vitesse team might create a Prometheus metric for errors with different dimensions that are meaningful for development. Another team might create a circuit breaker for error rate on Vitesse but misunderstand the nuance and then misuse this metric at the course level without context. So how might we do better? In my previous role, I helped build products and teams to help companies with their hardest problems by reasoning about data, pipelines, and platforms with Palantir. I found you can create massive business results when people speak the same language and reason about data using that same language. Oftentimes, one team's definition of dimension X means something very different between teams and especially business groups. So let's take a different approach. How might we create a common language to increase legibility and impact complexity across teams? How might we create an integrated diagnosis and reasoning about complex system interactions with people in Slack? How might we evolve our observability culture? How can we share business impact, ease of implementation, and increases in developer velocity? This body of work was a slow conspiracy, sprinted on between many teams and didn't happen overnight. I wanna say a special thank you to Suman and Ryan on the observability team who founded this thesis around Slack Trace and all the folk who improved the CI ecosystem with traces. During this Q&A session, I'd love to hear your stories on what drove adoption and what did it. But first, 
how did we come to this approach? It is slow is the hardest problem to debug in distributed systems. It is flaky is the most heard problem by internal teams, internal tools teams. A tracing system doesn't tell me what is slow or flaky, or more importantly, why. It's left as an exercise to the reader. Most of the utility of tracing systems today are single use only. To get more, we have to use a vendor solution that may provide a few more answers depending on the UI and analytics. An in-depth exploration of Slack traces written by Suman, my mentor and lead of the observability team, and can be found in the blog link in the blog post linked. For the purposes of this talk, I'll share a sky high view of the motivation and this infrastructure. First, we start with a span event structure such that we can create an event once and use it in multiple places. For example, a function within web app might create a single span event. This span event will contain context for the rest of the user request with more span events. Now we can ingest span events from multiple clients and are able to craft views from the same data model by processing it through Kafka. Users can access spans through data warehouse, through Prestel SQL queries, and real-time storage like Honeycomb or Elasticsearch or full text search. And now back to CI. Here's a very simplified view of our CI workflows for users and infrastructure. I'll use web app and E2E -E tests for purposes of illustration. Web app is where most engineers at Slack spend their development time. It ties together business logic from each client and dependent services. The CI workflow probably looks familiar. A UI does development, on their local branch, pushes it to GitHub, opens a PR, and are presented with test results. The screenshots show DMs from Checkpoint, an internal CI CD platform. It drives and bridges user workflows between GHG, uh, GitHub Enterprise, AWS services like S3 and Kubernetes, Jenkins, Console, and QA environments that are beefy machines running Slack to execute end-to-end -end tests. You might ask, what might go wrong? Good question. When I joined in 2019, a lot of existing CI logic was written by the CTO and early employees. It was mostly untouched for four years and it mostly worked well enough. Well, why trace? To find causation. Today, there are many more downstream services from web app. Cardinality for CI traces are also very different from other use cases. CI has lower volume, so there's no need for sampling, but higher criticality. C CI requests go through critical interconnected systems where a fault at any system means that a user is blocked. So what does a fault look like? It means users hit retry on their tests and are frustrated. Between 2017 and 2020, Slack saw a 10% month over month growth in test execution count. This led to a lot of systems being stretched to their limit. Before a series of projects around GitHub load, circuit breaking on dependencies, anomaly detection, flakiness reduction, and more recent workflow changes, we were seeing a percentage flake rate at approximately 50%. Today, it's around five. With a flake rate that's around 50, Developers no longer have trust in tests and have a very slow velocity because they're forced to hit retry. And this generally leads to frustration. Observability through tracing played a role in each of these projects. Today, we're about 10x better um, when we're measuring flakiness rate per PR. Both velocity and confidence have increased in recent developer surveys as well. And every day we're still learning how to understand, operate and evolve this very complex system we call Slack. In the past years, many business requirements, services and teams changed from where an RCI infrastructure was built. Early on in my time here, I saw an opportunity to work with the observability team to build a better set of tools to understand and to change how we understood causation and CI. Let me share how we got there. I looked at my early Slack history and found my first conversation with Suman a few days ago. 
I had heard about its exploration and building its flat trace. I understood a similar problem in data platforms from my previous work and reached out. I then spent an afternoon to build a cheap prototype with a hypothesis that this set of tooling would become a critical and compounding value add for developers. An easy place to prototype was our test runner, affectionately known as CI bot. Even during this PR rollout and a couple of simulated test runs, I noticed Git checkout was slow for a portion of our fleet. It turned out a few instances in our auto scaling group were not being updated. Easy, cool. Um, and now here's a juicy incident. This is now a few months later. It's day two of a multi-day, multi-team incident. Day one, our teams are scrambling with one-off hacks to try and bring a few overloaded systems under control. On the morning of day two, I added our first cross-service trace and reused the same instrumentation from our test runner. Very quickly with Honeycomb's bubble up, it became clear where problems were coming from. Git LFS on a portion of the fleet had slowed down the entire system. Over the next month, this sort of cross-system interaction um, led to targeted investments on how we can add this throughout checkpoint traces. Here's a sample of some of the shared dimensions we created for users and developers in CI to make queries in Honeycomb legible and more accessible. These dimensions were stubbed early in a library and instrumented with a few clients. Since then, various teams have extended and reused these dimensions for their use cases. But back to the root challenge. Developer frustration across Slack was increasing due to flaky test runs over the last few years. Flaky test runs was one of the top reported issues in developer surveys for a few quarters. By mid-2020, automation teams across Slack had a daily 30-minute triage session to triage and focus on the flakiest tests. Automation team leads hesitated to introduce any additional variants on how we use the Cypress platform and end -to -end test framework. The, the belief was that flakiness for, was from the test code itself. Yet there wasn't great progress by focusing on the tests. I typically work on the infra side of the world and felt strongly we could do better with causation on grade failures by instrumenting how we use the Cypher stream. Grade failures are where the system reports itself as healthy, and yet the application, in this case, tests, report a failure or flake. After some negotiating and identifying no verifiable decrease in performance nor resiliency, we scoped a short experiment. We'd instrument the high level platform runtime for a month to capture some runtime variables. What could go wrong? Well, a lot went right. <laughs> we discovered a few runtime variables that correlated very, very strongly with higher flake rates. In this graph, you can see compute hours spent on just flaky runs. At peak, we were spending roughly 90K hours per week of very large, very expensive machines on tests that were discarded because results were flaky. To build confidence and address return uh, concerns at every merge and hypothesis tests, we queued up a revert PR at the same time. We never re reverted. A challenge we saw in CI is expertise and fuzzy service boundaries, especially when it, came, when it came to services operated for internal use like dev or, C, or QA. A broken dependent service like search or an upgrade in a vendor's checkout library API means that these tests will start to flake for users in CI. While a full discussion of anomaly detection and circuit breakers are beyond the scope of this talk, I hope to share a few screenshots of how we were able to build the glue for service and automation teams to have discussions in Slack with observability. Test suite owners may not be distributed systems experts. Service teams may not be aware of how internal customers are using these services. And so actionable observability into lightweight triage workflows with links and starting threads for each of these issues was the key. In conjunction, these pieces presented a working space for disjoint teams to find causes for CI flakiness and give awareness when a test suite or dependent service had issues. Finally, I'd love to hear how you solve these type of challenges at your company. 
Thank you all very much for listening to a few stories, and I'd love to open the floor to questions. All right, let's give it up for Frank. Thank you, Frank. That was a great chat. Um, don't forget to, as I mentioned in the beginning, jump into the Slack channel, drop questions there. We'll be pulling those out and throwing them at Frank here. Um, but I can certainly kick one off. I, I, one of the things that came up for me watching the, the talk was like, uh, how kind of easy it seemed, right? Like a lot of people I talk to, it feels like tracing is kind of this like dark art of some sort. And um, it, it didn't seem like that. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could like just talk about your hands-on experience about adding tracing um, and, and using it for debugging. Do you need to be some sort of like tracing grandmaster or what was your experience there? Yeah. <laughs> um, like in the talk I described, whipping something up in a shell script over the course of an afternoon and I think part of my background is in design and so building really cheap, jank, almost janky prototypes that may not be perfect, but help us start to understand parts of the system that we didn't have before. Um, so like the like an MMO might be, let's observe around and find out. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think um, like each version of that, including like the instrumentation during the instrumentation during that incident, it's like, yeah, this is not perfect code, but it helped us solve a very specific problem and understand a part of the system that we didn't have before. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I like that. It, it's it's very iterative. It's very lightweight. Kind of, you're you're getting in there and letting the instrumentation lead you into posing new questions and adding more instrumentation, but it doesn't feel like it's tricky or hard or difficult. Um, I do think people can get stuck with like the upfront, like I need to trace all of the things to start with. And we see a lot of benefit in that kind of like iterative loop of, you know, asking a question, trying to figure out what need information you need to, to get the answer to that. Yeah. yeah. Like with like Prometheus metrics, right? I feel like this at like previous companies as well. Um, it's like you can have tens of thousands of Prometheus metrics with different dimensions. And because we're somewhat started from scratch with observability and CI, we we're able to like start stubbing some of this out and building an enum for what canonical trace dimensions might be. And that really helps like make this easier to understand and to easier to explore and like yeah, ask questions of honeycomb and our systems. Right. Yeah, right. Well, you're, you're pointing back to, you know, with with a Prometheus setup, you kind of you get all the auto instrumentation or a lot of that comes that way, right? You kind of turn it on and all of a sudden you've got all this information. It feels like you've got a lot to work with and you're kind of really set up for success. And then you start trying to ask those questions. You're like, I don't even know where to go. Like, how do I sift through this to kind of get what I actually want? Um, and it's interesting. I, I, I do see a lot of our customers that want to start with auto instrumentation for tracing. And it makes a lot of sense, right? You get a lot of rich value out of that immediately, um, but almost maybe taking the opposite approach of just kind of incrementally adding your own customization um, gives you that like that really high value data right off the bat and you start to see some of these insights pretty quickly. Yeah, I think oh. like on a like development perspective, um, like one change we made in 2019 was to a code base I typically um, don't work in, in, in web app. And one way I was able to kind of like understand how pieces fit together was with tracing to put in like easy small flags to understand, well, if we change how we initialize this part of our QA setup, does that affect anything in that code base? Mm. Um, and so it helped like really build out our understanding of well, code bases that, um, yeah, our team typically doesn't work in. Yeah. Uh, we've got a question here from Lee. Uh, he's wondering how do y'all encourage your engineers to be curious about their code and ask more interesting questions of their code? How do you encourage that kind of ownership? Oh, that's a heavy one. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, ownership is, there, I, I'm gonna shove that for a sec. That like can mean a lot of different things. Yeah. Um, I think curiosity, right? Like, we all want to know more about our code, but like, oftentimes it's not easy to reason about 
really, really complex systems, right? I think, um, and I'm bad with like the attribution of this quote because it's just like observability. I think this may have been Liz in like a blog post or um, yeah, tweet. It's like observability helps you observe your or understand your deployed code. Tests help you figure out um, what your code should be doing. Right. And right in CI, there's like some tension and there's like a little bit of both. Um, um, but to your question about curiosity, well, start to show and share some of these stories on how you came to understood or understand parts of your system as you built them and potentially um, just iterate and build out easy interfaces for um, other teams um, to start using, um, yeah, this way of thinking. Yeah. No, I think that that rhymes a lot with what some of the answers you're getting back to your question in Slack around what do people do to uh, get to get adoption across the organization, right? And so there was a lot of uh, people pointing out, you know, having honeycomb charts in incident reports, bringing up honeycomb charts and and honeycomb and engineering wide demos. Um, those sorts of ideas, right? To just kind of keep putting the idea in front of people. Um, and then you can just, yeah, just keep it top of mind and, and show people, get people intrigued and interested, right? And then they kind of can take it from there. Yeah, I, I think um, like one question is always like, what, what are you trying to solve right now? Um, and oftentimes I found exploring and putting in like, Feature like if you have a feature that's risky enough to put behind a like well probably mm. everything should be behind a feature flag if you follow that way of like development but it's like if something is really risky well how might we prototype and understand how users interact with it how it interacts with other parts of our system if you're more of on an infra team um, how might you understand that with tracing you get a lot of great like easy telemetry thanks to yeah. Thanks to like the honeycomb ecosystem, and I like very like in very broad and brief strokes talk through um, and describe Slack trace. Like th I think having multiple lenses to the same data set is like powerful. Um, like at Slack, the observability team has built out interfaces in, with both like ES, um, so like you can search for stuff in Kibana and analytics, so we can run like really big, <laughs> like more computation heavy uh, Presto queries against it and the back end of that is happening. So yeah. Cool. We've got maybe time for one quick question. Any value, yeah. did you find any value in comparing tracing between runs or is most of the focus on runs in isolation during the, the incident you're talking about? Tracing between runs. Oh, yes. Um, so in my so I uh, have an appendix over here, and maybe I, I can just like anecdotally talk through it. Um, yeah. Like one 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 area of, um, yeah, like one area of deep dive is our automation engineering team, really taking traces and running with it. Like one recent experiment was debugging, a like Docker timeout, and the engineer that drove a project to understand well how do we minimize Docker timeout. Um, had helped um, us instrument test case tracing that's now used by multiple teams. But with um, understanding Docker timeouts, we found a really, really high variance in how we were pulling Cypress um, dependencies in NPM. And due to that variance, well, now we can understand and potentially build an improvement on that by pre-baking some of the container and potentially, yeah, other optimizations. But cool. that we only saw, like, yeah, a little bit later. And with, yeah, just fast, small telemetry. Awesome. Well, thank you, Frank. Uh, it's been great to chat with you. Thank you for your talk.